Bowl Sunday? Oh, yeah. You guys know that it's a holiday these days. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know. I, we just kind of get these streaming things like Hulu and stuff, and they'll pop up commercials once in a while. And just saw the latest one, and it's um, Agent State Farm. And you're like, what is this? And the next thing you know, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he'll be revealed on February 11th, 2024. Like, wow, man, they're really building up the Super Bowl these days. So uh, anyways, they even moved it back so you can still come to church. Hallelujah. The best part is just get to go hang out with Kevin. So go to Kevin, watch football, eat some food, have just a good time. So um, guys, you know where we're at. We're in Revelation chapter 13. So if you want to grab your Bibles and if you want to stand with me um, one more time, uh, it'll probably be two more times, but anyways. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to take the first half of the chapter and then we'll do the second half next week, but we're working verse by verse through the book of Revelation. We find ourselves in what we term the Great Tribulation time, and so chapter 13, we pick it up in verse 1, and this is the beast. Chapter 13, verse 1, the book of Revelation, John writes, from the island of Patmos, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, and I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him authority, I'm sorry, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Uh, So one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled or wondered and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. They inform us of things to come. We thank you for your son who was slain from the foundation of the world who gives life. Thank you for the blood that was shed, for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross, the man upon it, for life in his name. And God, that you made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God by faith in him. God, you're awesome and wonderful. You've blessed our time together this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, you know you can be seated. Good morning to you. So we're in the middle of um, the book of Revelation, and it's an interesting thing to be um, reading through a section that you're just not going to be part of in a f- in the future sense. You know, and... Um, it's as though you could have Revelation and you could just do like chapters 1 through 3, right? Comes, the Lord Jesus Christ comes and sees the Apostle Paul or the, um, the Apostle John on the island. And then you have the church age, which is of utmost importance, which I just thoroughly enjoyed with all the slides in the different areas when we went over all of that. And then you could just fast forward to chapter 19 and chapter 19, guess who comes back? You know him by name. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes back and sets all things right. And these individuals rise up against him. He speaks. He conquers. He wins. He sets up the millennial reign. And then you have the new heavens and the new earth. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But for some reason, you have these chapters, chapter 6, mostly through like chapter 18. And the Lord's like, "Um, you don't really need to know, but you get to know. You're like, very cool. And so he tells you things that have happened in the Old Testament, and now they have their culmination, if you would, in the New Testament. And we were talking, uh, I think on Thursday, and one of them reminded me, if I can say this right, right, the Old Testament is the New Testament Hmm. concealed. 
and then the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Right? We'll jump on all that as we get in this whole 24-hour thing, and he'll go over some of the stuff I'm talking about this morning. But there's things mentioned in the Old Testament that maybe don't have their, they don't have their full revelation until all these things are kind of unveiled. And so it's a real kindness of God to share these things with us. But please note, this is future, right? The rapture has already happened. Whenever that is going to occur, it could happen today. It could happen next week. It could happen 50 years from now. Nobody knows the time and the hour and all of that. But after that happens, these things start to come to pass. And you begin to see these things in like Revelation chapter 6, because chapter 4 is um, the throne room of God. And you see the four living creatures and the 24 elders and they fall and they worship. And then you've got chapter five, which is about redemption. And then you've got not just, um, you know, angels singing songs, but you actually have uh, people like us whose names are in the book of life. And they're singing a new song, You Are Worthy. And so chapter five, or chapter four and chapter five is throne room stuff, things in the eternals. And then you get to chapter six and you're introduced to this individual that he has this name called the Antichrist. And you see in verse two, right, a white horse and he who sat and had a bow. And it's, this is most likely a reference to the Antichrist and he's an imposter and he's an imitator. And so he imitates the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why he's called the Antichrist. And this is our first um, introduction to him in the book of Revelation. And then you just have chaos going on, right? You've got, what, this, the second, you got these, what, they call them the four horsemen. Right, the first one, the white horse, the Antichrist, then you've got war, and then you've got famine, and then you've got pestilence, and you've just got complete chaos going on on planet Earth. And then you have some other things going on, and then we get over here into chapter 12, and the influence really becomes upon the nation of Israel. And we talked about um, last week, I believe, time just is just disappearing. It's really weird. It's almost the middle of February. It's crazy, right? But... You have this great sign that appears, and this is the nation of Israel, and she gives birth to 12 sons, and we're talking about Jacob and um, the four women he was with and the 12 sons he has, and they're the 12 tribes of Israel, and um, the enemy is just all about destroying them. And then you get into chapter 13, and you have this beast, and it seems like this beast, most good commentators will say that this is the Antichrist. It's just a name for him, and you see that the dragon in verse 2 gives him power, and so he seems to be empowered by the dragon who we learned in chapter 12 is Satan or Lucifer. He's also called um, the devil. His name just means adversary and his name means accuser. So you have an adversary in case you didn't realize that. I think most of you probably do. The world, the flesh and the devil and that he is in opposition to you and he accuses you before the throne of God day and night and they're probably all justified. You continue to screw up, and God continues to forgive you. What a wonder, right? Jesus intercedes, and Satan accuses, and you find that in chapter 12. It's, I don't know, it's in there somewhere. Chapter 9, chapter 10, now we have to find it. Verse 9, he deceives the whole world, and then in verse 10, he accuses them before God day and night. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, he overcame them. We overcome them by the blood of the lamb. We're the testimony. He's going to love our lives. We talked about that last week. And so as we get into chapter 13, um, I'm just going to kind of break the chapter down, just kind of go over some information, and then we'll have some points of application at the end. Um, please remember there's at least 550 illustrations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. So the better you know the Old Testament, the better Revelation is understandable to you. And we'll point some of those out here. So as this guy starts out, it seems as though when he talks about the sea and the sand on the sea, this is referring to the Gentile nations, right? And in the Gentile nations, this beast rises out of the sea or the sea is a reference to Gentiles. So it seems because from the Gentiles, there comes this world leader or this world ruler. Now, we just term him the Antichrist. Some call him a super leader. Um, but it seems as though, and it's funny they use these terms, right? And I say they, I'm talking about, you know, the guys like Wearsby and McGee and um, who's the guy, the Calvary guy out of Oregon, um, Applegate, um, John... 
Torsten. Different guys that I just read. But it seems as though that he heads up this like European League of Nations. Now the question is like, who are the nations? That's a very good question. Nobody knows. You gotta assume Russia's gonna be in there, right? You gotta assume maybe Great Britain and maybe France. Yeah, we'll see. But anyways. <laughs> But the reason they say it is because of these terms in here um, on his, what, there's ten horns, and on the ten horns, ten crowns. And then if you jump back into the book of Daniel, it talks about the feet, and if you've looked at your feet lately, if they're normal feet, you've got ten toes. And so you have the statue that's made, and the statue has ten toes. And so it seems as though the Antichrist is going to be heading up this League of Nations that consists of these ten major world powers. Who they are, nobody knows. But it seems as though they're probably going to be kind of in league in Europe. Maybe the U.S. is part of it. Nobody really knows who they are. But there's going to be ten of them. And it's what you would, would call the revived Roman Empire. And that's maybe the best term to use. right? The revived Roman Empire kind of started as a republic, and then it moved over to kind of an empire, if you would. And then it's kind of revived. And he's got these seven heads, and we talked about that. It seems like these are these seven mountains, possibly, which is what Rome is built on. But we'll get to that in the chapter 17. But he has a blasphemous name. The beast was like a leopard, right, his feet. And then you got, what, these different animals, right? You've got um, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Now, if you jump back into the book of Daniel, these things are very um, familiar to you because the world empires. And so the bear, rep and they kind of move in order. You could go, well, I think it's bear, let's see, I wrote this down, I should know this. Lion, bear, leopard, and Daniel. And so the lion represents the nation of Babylon, right? This, this fierce animal that Daniel sees. And then it moves over to the bear, which is Medo-Persia. And then it moves over to the leopard, which is the nation of Greece, or um, what was Alexander the Great. Leopards move very quickly. Alexander the Great conquered the entire known world in like a decade. The guy was an incredible military general. Yeah, I think he died at like the age of 32 in India. Like there's no more nations to conquer. I conquered all the nations of the world, but I couldn't conquer um, myself. This was just like great struggle, if you would. But he dies very young. John sees it, and he sees it in reverse order because it's already come to pass. And so he sees it, what? He sees the leopard, which was like the nation of Greece. He sees... Um, the feet like a bear, talking about Mesopotamia, Persia, the mouth of like a lion. So he's seeing it in reverse order, if you would. So it seems as though what he is seeing is the revival of the Roman Empire, right? It was Babylon. And you guys know, like, these nations build off each other, right? That the Medo-Persians take some of what they learn from the Babylonian Empire and they incorporate it. And then the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks come along and they kind of incorporate what they learn from the Medo-Persians and then from the Babylonians. And then the Romans come along, and they just take kind of all of it and mix it all together. And then that gets dispersed, and then that seems like it gets revived at the end times. Now, I've already told you, some of you, you just don't even care. You're like, won't be here. Doesn't matter. Looking forward to the rapture. Some of you are like, what does this stuff mean, Tom? So this is for you. <laughs> right? And so you have the mouth of a lion, right? Then the dragon gives him his power, and so the Antichrist and this League of Ten Nations, the, um, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world, empowers these individuals, and he gives them power, his throne, and he gives them great authority. And then you've got a bunch of these W's in here, right? This first one, and it's nice because as like a preacher or commentator, you can just like use the word wonder. Like, what does it mean? I don't know. I wonder just like you do. I saw one of his heads, and so you have one of these world leaders, it seems like, being mortally wounded. What does it mean? That's a great question. And if you come to know the answer, you let me know. Because it doesn't seem like anybody knows. Maybe he gets some type of wound, looks like he's going to die from, and then he's healed from it. Is he healed by the Antichrist? Is he healed by the dragon? Who knows? We know that some of Moses's, not Moses's, um, Pharaoh's guys were doing like supernatural miracles and powered by spiritual forces of wickedness and all of that. So who knows, right? But there is wonder because you look in verse 3 and all the world marveled or they wondered about it. Like, what does this mean? What is going on? Who is this individual, right? This Antichrist comes to power. His fame is sudden. His authority is supreme and he gets this mortal wound, but he's healed from it. 
Now, in saying all this, hmm, I feel like we need to read this. Oh, I had it way earlier, so I regress a little bit. We haven't read this yet, and we need to. So flip over to Daniel chapter 9, because if we're going to talk about this stuff, we need to go to Daniel chapter 9, because this is one of the great references to it. Because what you need to know about this guy, if you're interested in this stuff, this world leader that's coming upon the scene, um, you know, we call it the Great Tribulation Period, which is seven years. And if you cut that bad boy in half, three and a half years, or as we read in Revelation 13, it's 42 months. Okay? And so three and a half years is 42 months, or 1,260 days and all of that. So this individual, at first he's a peacekeeper, and it seems as though, can you imagine being the individual that brings peace to the Middle East? Right? They have been trying to do this for ages, right? that you can get Muslims and Jews and Christians to all get along. And so the rapture happens, just world chaos. And then you have this period of three and a half years where this individual comes along and he brings peace. And he brings peace between all these nations, and more than likely, it seems as though he's going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple. Now, that's going to be quite the feat to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. Because you guys know about the Dome of the Rock that's there. And so, you know, if you talk to certain individuals, it seems as though like they're like, hey, you know what? We could build a wall on the northern side of the Temple Mount. And there's, and I think I've brought this up before, but I'll say it again. There's two points under the Temple Mount. You guys know the Temple Mount is built just on a bunch of arches. So I think it's 10 acres, and it's just arches everywhere. And there's two things that come to a point, like two little mountain points, if you would. All the rest is arches that they built this thing on. Well, one of them is in the Dome of the Rock, and the other one of these mountain points that comes up is they have something that is called the Dome of the Spirits that's built upon it. And so some think that the Jews will have the authority to build their temple on the Dome of the Spirits, then have a wall, and then you have the Dome of the Rock. So it's very possible, and you guys probably know about the Temple Institute in Israel. They've got everything all set up. They have found their blue dye, and they found their purple dye, and they've got this ark built, and they've got this over here built, and they're all ready to just move. They just need the authority to do so. Just, it's wild, right? Like, you kind of begin to think about these things. Like, this is coming upon the earth one day, that there's an individual that's going to come along, and he's going to be the man, and he's going to bring peace to the Middle East, which will just be a wonder, and it'll just be a marvel. And so, halfway through this thing, he's going to just be like, fooled you, persecution. And that's really the great tribulation, the last half of the grit, seven years, the last half is three and a half years, which is 42 months, which we read about in Revelation 13. And you come back to Daniel chapter 9, and you pick it up. What is it? I mean, it's, these are fairly long verses. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and I'm just going to kind of whet your appetite. There's books written on this stuff. We'll go over it in the 24-hour stuff again. Um, but verse, you know, Daniel is basically praying. He's interrupted in his prayer. And then in verse 24, it says 70 weeks are determined for who? The Jewish people, right? So the great tribulation is specifically to the Jewish people, right? For your people and for your holy city or Jerusalem. Now, a week is seven years, right? There's weeks of days, there's week of weeks, and there's weeks of years. And so if you wanted to go back into Genesis, right, and you go like, how long did, who is the scoundrel, Jacob? How long did Jacob have to work to get Rachel after he was tricked by Laban and he married Leah? Yeah, it says he worked a week for her. Or seven years. Like, oh, okay, so this is a week of years. So 77s, or 490 years, are determined for the Jewish people to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So 490 years. From when? Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Who went back and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem? 
this guy named Nehemiah did. And he was given the decree in Nehemiah chapter 1 by Artaxerxes. And these guys like um, Sir Robert Anderson, they write a book called The Coming Prince, and he gives you like an exact date. And it's, I'm gonna, I think it's like April 6, 40, 445 BC or something. But anyways, he does all the dating for you. He says, from that time forth, you could just like mark your calendar, and now I know when the Messiah is going to come. Well, that's very nice of you, Lord, right? So there, from the command, until what? The Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, or 49 years, right? The command's given, oh, okay, great. The walls are built, okay, great. And then, um, and 62 weeks, or 69 weeks, the treats shall be built again, the walls, and troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, or after the full 69 years, the Messiah is going to be what? Cut off, but not for himself but the people of the prince who is to come. And it's cool, like, living now, and you get, like, to look back and see it all come to pass. Like, oh, okay, so when Jesus says, and some of these guys will say, and this is what's really cool, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and you guys know, like, they tried to make Jesus king, like, numerous times. He does something like, oh, my goodness, let's make him king. Jesus like, nope, my time is not yet. And then he organizes the whole thing called the triumphal entry. Right, like he actually always like, hey, I need for you to go get the donkey, and we're going to settle this up. Okay, now today's, we're going to do it now. And then as he does it, and then the people, right, they sing, and the Pharisees are like, you need to do something about it. And then Jesus says, if you would have known even this, what? The day of the things that make for your peace. Like, was it the exact day that Daniel prophesied about in Daniel chapter 9? More than likely. So if you were a good Bible um, scholar and Jew, you could actually mark the day out, and you could have just tracked it all the way down. Because you know, there's 400, what is it, 483 years. This command was given in this year. Okay, come to this year. Okay, the Messiah, the Prince, is going to be coming on this day, and Jesus held him accountable for it. That's quite the thought. All right, and so the Messiah shall be cut off. You guys know about the crucifixion. He didn't die for himself, but he died for the people. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. That happened in 70 AD by Titus Vespasian when he wiped out the city of Jerusalem. And the end shall be with a flood and the, and the war. To, he shall, and then he shall confirm a covenant with many for how long? One week. So we are living in like this parenthetical pause between the crucifixion, and the resurrection until the great tribulation. And all of a sudden, you've got almost 2,000 years in between this prophecy. Like, we're still waiting for the last week. And so if you want, you can go do some serious digging into Daniel chapter 9, and it's just a wonderful section. But note, he shall confirm a covenant with them, many, for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. So it seems as though the Jews are able to sacrifice, they're able to do offerings, and to do that, guess what? You need something, and it's called a temple. So that's why I say these things like, oh, it seems like they'll have a temple back on the Temple Mount. Why? Well, because of what Daniel 9 says, and because of what Revelation says. Like, oh, okay, that someone's going to come along and bring peace to Jews and to Muslims, and to do it after the rapture, and then all of a sudden you have like, oh, all is good and all is well for about... 1,260 days, and then in the middle he says, no more persecution. Because in the middle of the week, he brings an end to it. You can't sacrifice no more, you can't do any more offerings. All of that is done and over. And then you have, right, was in chapter 12, right, they flee, right, they flee off to the mountains and probably off to the city of Petra and all of that. And so I wanted to read Daniel chapter 9. We haven't read it yet in the book of Revelation, so I kind of did you a disservice. And so, therefore, that has now been done. Uh, Revelation, back to Revelation chapter 13. Okay. And so you see, and I say this uh, a few times, I'm going to say it right here in verse 5, right? 42 months. You see in chapter 6 of verse 12, 1,260 days. And so, this is three and a half years, right? In the middle of the seven-year period, halfway through, things flip on their head. And so the first thing that we saw was wonder. 
the marvel of the world and that they follow the beast. And then you see in verse 4, and I'm just going to move through these real quick because they're not of utmost importance. You see in verse 4, your other W is the idea of worship, right? Satan sought worship from the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember in Matthew chapter 4. We don't need to read that. You probably recollect, hey, I'll, you know, I'll give you everything, all the kingdom of, of the entire world. They all belong to you. All you got to do is bow down and worship Jesus right, right here behind me. Not going to do that. But Satan seeks it, and they worship the dragon. So this is Satan who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped who was like the beast, who was able to make war against him. And then the other thing that you have, well, a guy, like one guy says, Satan worship becomes the religion of the world during the Great Tribulation time. That's a fascinating thought, right? Like all that you wanted, okay, there you get. You get to have it for about three and a half years. Just this short little sliver of history. That's, it's almost as though we just like need to blow through like the next five chapters just to get to Revelation 19. Because then Jesus comes back. Like, all right, here he is. This is who we're looking for. But um, the other thing that you're going to see in here is in verse 5. He was given a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies. Um, and it would be just the idea of words, right? First there's wonder and then there's worship. And then he's very persuasive with words. And great leaders are very good orators. They're very well spoken. That was one of the knocks against, I'm sitting here trying to think, I think that was one of the knocks against, was it Richard Nixon? No, it wasn't Richard Nixon. Whoever was running against JFK. And was it Nixon? Yeah, and... They said one of the reasons that he lost was because JFK was a really nice looking guy and he was a very good speaker. And when I think of very good speakers, I think of people like Barack Obama. The guy's a very good orator. Like just as you watch him and watch him talk and watch him present things like this guy's a very good speaker. You know, one gentleman, he wrote about Adolf Hitler and his book Mein Kampf. He says, quote, he brought to expression the secrets of the human soul. He roused the tired and lazy. He fired up the indifferent and the doubting, and he turned cowards into men and weaklings into heroes that Adolf Hitler could literally mesmerize crowds just by his words. And he was one of just the great proponents of propagation, of propaganda. And all of a sudden you see right here in verse 5, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So there's wonder about this individual, then there's worship for, the, um, for Satan, and then there's an image that they actually worship and he brings to life that we'll get into next week but then he's also given these words that he speaks right in verse 6 he opened his mouth and blasphemy against god blasphemed his name his tabernacle on those who dwell in heaven so he just speaks these great blasphemous words and then the last thing which we've seen which is nothing new to us but then you have he makes war he's just an individual war he's an individual bloodshed you guys know in john chapter 10 he came to steal kill and destroy right that he just makes war and um, his power, I don't like this. One guy says, please remember that his power is delegated. His power is not inherent, meaning God allows it. Right? He just doesn't have inherent power. He's like, I'm going to allow you to do this for a short time. And we read in chapter, I think it was at the end of chapter 6, right? All that's going on, it says the people on earth that whose names are not in the book of life, they still did not repent of their sorceries. They still did not repent of their sexual immoralities and of their wickedness, right? It's a real tragic time about the hardness of the human heart. And here you have these individuals given over to the delusion, and they sit there and wonder and worship with words, and then they war against God. And he makes war against the saints, and he overcomes the saints. And please remember, this is post-rapture. This is great tribulation, not just tribulation, but great tribulation in the last half of the great tribulation, this time which is also called Jacob's trouble in the book of Jeremiah. Okay, all that being said, we'll give you some application now. And it's found in verse 10. And I find this fascinating that it's in this section because verse 9 maybe makes you think of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Right, he speaks to the church and he says, he who has what? An ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then in verse 9 here, it's as though God is still pleading with these rebellious, hard-hearted, sinful men who are now being uh, warred against and people are coming to Christ during the tribulation time and now they're dying for their faith 
If you have an ear, let him hear. And at the end he says, here is the patience and faith of the saints. What applies in the great tribulation also applies now, doesn't it? Is there a need for God's people to continue on? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter 10, and you can flip there if you want to, and that's why I read it this morning in preparation for this, because it's the same word that's used in Revelation chapter 13, right? And the word is hupomone, and you find it in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. And he's talking about um, all the hardships that they're going through, that what, um, chapter 10, verse 32, right? You endured struggle with sufferings. You made a public spectacle, reproaches and tribulations, and um, you accepted the plundering of your goods, a better enduring possession. Therefore, and that's what I picked up in verse 35, therefore do not cast away your confidence, that's great reward, for you have need of what? Endurance. That there is need for the Christian to continue along in the walk of faith. The word hupomone, or endure, it means to bear up under circumstances. It's the quality of character which does not allow somebody to surrender to circumstances or succumb to trial. So as you're going through difficult trials, you're going through difficult hardships, it's not towards people. Right? That's a whole different Greek word. It's like makarathume or something. But hupomone means just to bear up under circumstances. Are you going through difficult times? Bear up under it, right? It's that branch on the tree that begins to bend, and then a prop is com- props up the branch so that it doesn't break, right? To bear up under. Paul will t- or Peter tells you to add to your faith what? Hupomone in 2 Peter chapter 1. Paul tells you in Romans 5 that you should glory in what? tribulations because they produce hupomone right um to the colossian paul prays that you would have hupomone with joy that when you go through trials and go through difficulties hey that you would bear through it with joy i don't know about you but i just hate that idea (laughs) right you're like going through like some sicknesses and you're like man you should just bear up under it with joy what are you talking about right now? I'm going through some you know, financial trials. I'm going through some family difficulties. Well, guess what? I'm praying that you will bear up under it with joy. So hupomone with a smile on your face is what Paul is saying. I pray. And he goes through this whole long prayer in Colossians chapter 1. And then John says that you would continue on. And it's an interesting thought. And it might be a stretch. But he would say that you would continue on as proof of your salvation. Now, that might be a strong term to use, but it comes from um, 1 John 2, verse 9. I'm just going to read 1 John 2, 19. He says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. It's as though time is the great tester that exposes whether somebody is really a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Because I don't got to tell you guys that it takes a while to get a little bitty stick called an apple tree or even a seed and stick it in the ground before you start eating apples. I mean, it would be nice to do it the next day, <laughs> but it doesn't work, right? There's a seed and a lot of work goes in. The thing blooms. Okay, three to four years later, oh, I finally get an apple off of this apple seed I planted years ago. And it just takes time. And John says, hey, they were not of us. They went out from us. They came for a time. Then they left. Oh, they were not of us. Oh, okay. They walked. They walked. At at least that's the way it looked. And then over time, they were like, oh, no, they were the seed that fell among the stones. They rejoiced. Oh, they were seed. But then they were gone. They didn't endure under trial or under difficulties or just over time. And I find it interesting John brings that up. And so Paul says that you would hupomone and Peter and um, who's our other guys? Peter and Paul and John, all to say the same thing. Hey, that you would hupomone, right? Bear up under. This makes me, for some reason, like think of marriage vows. Like you give marriage vows, and I'm a big fan of just the traditional marriage vows. And you guys know them, right? And 
that um, I'll be with you for better, for worse, sickness, health, richer, poorer, love and cherish. They're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I, that's a good reminder. Like when you're going through difficult times. Oh, no, I promise to be faithful to you in sickness and health and richer or poor. Oh, that's right. And Jesus will say, and essentially, possibly the same thing. And in, in, what is it? Luke chapter 14. He says, we should probably just read it, huh? Luke 14. And you'll be like, Tom, this doesn't say anything about marriage loss. I know, but it's very close. <laughs> Luke 14, and around verse 27, he talks about bearing his cross, being a disciple. And then in verse 28, and you might have a subtitle in your Bible about counting the cost. Right? When you get married, you should probably count the cost. And Jesus says, Verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man's a knucklehead. He began to build and was not able to finish. I mean, you could say, right, there's builders, and then he goes to generals. He says, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all or put the Lord Jesus Christ first cannot be my disciple. Right, that there's this need, I'm going to count the cost. Okay, that's death to self, it's taking on my cross, and so therefore I'm going to continue on with the Lord Jesus Christ for better, for worse, and sickness, and health, and richer or poor, until death do us part. Oh, then I just go to be with the Lord through death. Right, and so there's the first thing that you see in Revelation chapter 13, right? And I, I bring all that off of, just in case I didn't do this very well, and he says, here is the patience, right? That word patience is hupomone, to bear up under circumstances. I mean, it would be like a foolish thing. Like, I don't know. I don't really do these things because I think these guys are crazy. But like folks that do like ultra marathons, like they're going to go run 100 miles and you get to the starting line. And can you imagine a guy sprinting at the starting line of an ultra marathon? Oh, like, I don't think you've counted the cost. Do you have any idea how far you need to go? I ran a half marathon one time and I walked the first mile. Mainly because I was just mad. I cannot believe I'm doing this. <laughs> so I'm just going to walk. Then after a while, I was like, okay, I probably should start moving a little faster. But hey, how far do I need? Oh, I need to kind of count. Oh, yeah, I probably should train for this. Probably need to get certain shoes, et cetera. So whether you're running a marathon or whether you're engaging in a bike race or doing a triathlon or you're building a tower or you're going to war or you're walking with the Lord Jesus, hey, I'm going to continue on. I need to count the cost of what this is and so that I may continue, like it says in Hebrews chapter 10. And then the next thing he says in Revelation 13, patience, and he says, and faith. And what I love about this is if, I don't know if you're probably not still there, but in Hebrews chapter 10, and I know our time is starting to run short. I probably should have spent less time on the front side of this and more time on the back side of this. <laughs> but what follows, he says, you have need of endurance. And then he says in verse 38, the just shall live by what? And then he spends the next chapter, that's all he talks about. And he gives you all these examples, doesn't he? I think he, what, 39 times he uses the word faith. By faith, able. Well, let's see, God says, let's see, um, to come to me, there has to be a blood offering. I'm not exactly sure what all of that means, but yes, sir. And he comes with an offering, and then we know that Cain comes with fruit, and God rejects the fruit. No, 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 it's by blood that you come, by faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. And then he goes through these individuals like Abraham. I mean, Abraham didn't have a clue what was going on. I just need for you to go out. Yes, sir. And he goes out for a long time, we could say. I'm, I mean, I love what it says in chapter 11, verse, what, verse 11 at the end. By faith, Sarah conceived. 
because she judged him faithful who made the promise. Right? This word faith, it means to win over. If you have faith in me, that means I've won you over. If I have faith in you, you have won me over to your character, and I have been persuaded that you're trustworthy. Right? So faith is really these three C's, right? Confidence in the character of someone or something, and so therefore I commit to it. And so you have all these individuals, right? He says, hey, that you would continue on because the just shall live by faith. God has no pleasure in those who draw back, but in those who continue on, whether it's now or whether it's in the great tribulation time, right? But this is the patience and the faith of the saints. And you go to Moses and Joshua and Gideon and David and Nehemiah, and we could spend just all morning talking about these individuals, but by faith. Oh, I was won over and I was persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm going to commit myself to him. <laughs> Interest of time, I just am a little sorrowful, but we just have to move on. But by faith, right? By faith, they continued on. But then you have the last one, and it's found in Matthew 24, and it's not found in Revelation um, chapter 13 there. But it definitely applies because in Matthew 24, in verse 15, you have this term, um, the abomination of desolation. And so I regress once again to do a little history lesson, and it's going to be very brief. But this is more than likely a reference to a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who around 165 B.C. or so, um, I think he was part of the, um, it wasn't the Ptolemies of Egypt, I think it was the, Seleucid, the Seleucides or something in the north, but you have these two empires, right? These four generals after Alexander the Great, right, they divided the kingdom, Ptolemies in Egypt, the Seleucides in kind of northern Israel, and then you got a couple others, doesn't really matter. But these guys from the north, they come down and they lay waste to Israel, and they go into the temple, and um, Antiochus Epiphanes, it's recorded that he slaughters a pig and he offers it on the altar. Now, you guys know what the Jews think about pork, probably. Like, it is not kosher at all. And so, <coughs> when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet. So, Daniel speaks of this back in the book of Daniel about this individual that comes along. He doesn't name him, but it seems like he's Antiochus Epiphanes. And he outlaws all Torah reading, he outlaws all sacrifices and all worship to Yahweh, and he slaughters a pig in the temple, and this is abomination of desolation, and this is what sets off the Maccabean revolt, which is where you get the books of <coughs> First and Second Maccabees, these historical books. And so this is talking about this great tribulation. This is going to happen again, it seems like, in the great tribulation. The three and a half year mark, hey, it's cut off, you can't sacrifice no more. And then maybe something like what Antiochus Epiphanes did, maybe he was a prototype of what was to come. But before that is what fascinates me, because we talk about continue, we talk about confidence, and then the third thing we talk about would be charity. And he says it in here. Last week we talked about deception. And please note, right, Matthew 24 is the Sermon on the, or it's called the Olivet Discourse, and it's about end times. And the first thing Jesus says to you is be careful that you're not what? Deceived. I don't know about you, but I seem to bump into a Mormon every week. I just met another guy. You know, we're talking, he's like, um, you know, you're a pastor, yeah, and so we have a talk. Oh, yeah, I'm part of the LDS Church. And I was like, oh, my goodness, another one. Right? They're, they seem to just be everywhere. And I'm just like, oh my goodness gracious, right? Just deception. Right? And they see themselves as just another branch of Christianity and you know, no, you're wrong. You're not. But deception. Right? See that you're not deceived. And then notice he says it again in verse 11. Right? Then many false prophets will rise up and what? Deceive many. Right? So you got to be careful of deception. We talked about that last week. But then wars. We've talked about wars. And then there's famines, and then there's the beginning of um, sorrows, and then nations rise up against nation, and then tribulations come upon you. And then notice in verse 12, and this is where I jump on this third point. 
And because lawlessness will abound, and I don't think i got to convince any of you lawlessness is abounding in the day and age in which you live, what's the result? Agape of many will grow cold. Right? And here's this idea before the great tribulation time that I think is apropos for us is this idea of agape. And I think of this because this week, you know, I don't know how well you know 1 Corinthians 13, but there's these two words in there that really bother me. The first one is rude, and the second one is provoked. And I don't know about you, but I was just provoked this week. And then I'm immediately recall 1 Corinthians 13. Love is not... Ah, dang it. Right, like, you know, you read it like, uh, like the whole great tribulation, like, yep, it's coming, this stuff's going to happen. But for here and now, like, oh, yeah, Lord, help me to continue on. Okay, I can, I can continue on. And then I've got confidence in who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and I think all of us are on that boat. But then the third point, man, this idea of charity is very challenging. Right, that love suffers long, love is kind. Like, are you growing in agape in the days in which you live, or is agape growing cold? Love starts on its kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't need to be noticed. Right? It doesn't parade itself. And then it says agape is not rude. It doesn't seek its own. How are you doing? Right? Agape is not provoked, and it doesn't keep a record of any wrongs that you've done. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Right? It rejoices in the truth. And here is this idea at the end times, right before the abomination of desolation. Jesus says, be careful. Deceptions and wars and rumors of wars and hardships and difficulties, that lawlessness abounds and borders begin to disappear. And there's great wickedness across the globe that you've got to be very careful that your heart may grow cold and indifferent to the things of the Lord and the people around you. Because the fruit of the Spirit is agape. And I don't think I need to harp on this for too much longer. Right? Jesus says what in John, I think it's John 13, that the world will know that you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ by your love for your fellow believers. How well do I love the people around me that I fellowship with in Christian circles? How well am I loving them? The world takes note of it, and they recognize it. I say, yeah, you can go get lost in biblical prophecy and see all these things in the future, but in reality, of utmost importance, the great mark of the Christian is agape love. Father, we we ask that you would just help us, Lord, to continue on. And I believe I sit amongst many people who are very confident in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, that our confidence in you and our continuing on with you will be done so with agape. Lord, that we would be long-suffering with the people around us, that we wouldn't be provoked, that we would be compassionate, we wouldn't be rude, but we would be kind and we would be gentle. It is a great challenge, and I'm very thankful that you tell us beforehand of these things that are going to come to pass. And you say, because of all of these things, be very careful of your charity. Because lawlessness will abound. As much as you fight against it, it will abound. And because of it, the love of many grows cold and it grows indifferent. And then we become like the church at Laodicea. And so, God, that you would help us, Lord, in these things that we would continue on in kindness, that we would continue on in loving our fellow believers, and that the world would take note that we love one another as you have loved us. And so, Father, we come back to the simplicity once again of the greatest of all the commandments, that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then we would love our neighbor as ourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two things. So, Father, we thank you that you've loved us first. Help us, in turn, to love those around us. Thank you, God, your great faithfulness to us. 
the blood that was shed, forgiveness that is procured, salvation that belongs to us. Thank you, Lord, that our names are written in the book of life. We can read about these things in Revelation, and it's great information, it's great discussing points, but it's not for us that we're with you in the eternals. Very thankful for it. So, Father, help us to love one another. We love you, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name.